Well, hey, everybody, this is episode five of the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. I'm Jody Collier. I'm Roy Crumrine. And I'm Jonathan Lewis. We know we said in the last episode that we were going to have on Joel Bushman from Overkill Chassis, but he had a couple things come up and wasn't able to join us. So we actually called IC Weld Isaac, and uh, he accepted and as a last minute thing to get on here and we really appreciate his time so welcome to the podcast isaac oh thank you thank you uh, uh really excited to, to be on here and uh just want to say too to everybody you know all of the guests that we have on this show they're all just donating their time and and uh information and stuff so if something more pressing comes up in their world that takes priority absolutely all right isaac you know i, I i've been looking at your account for some time now we met at fab tech and uh so it seems like most of your work is heavy equipment repair is that right yes yeah most so, of my stuff is out in the field yeah and you're out in texas austin texas yep austin texas cool if you, if you would if you'd be so kind just kind of fill us in on you know just kind of like what really makes up the bulk of your work? What's your normal day? There probably is. I'm going to guess there is no such thing as a normal day because the phone rings and crap hit the fan and somebody tried to weld something that they had no business welding and now you got to go bail them out and that sort of thing. But as best you can, kind of you know, fill us in on what a normal week or day looks like to you. Okay. Well, um, I have a, a, a variety of customers, of course, that call me and they know me for my uh, on-site repairs. And so my weeks uh, kind of fill up a little bit quickly, but uh, the customer will call me and say, hey, I got a backhoe that's broken. And of course, the owner doesn't really know what's wrong with it other than the individual who used it broke it. And so I just have to go and, <laughs> and fix it. It's always a surprise. So I show up and you know, sometimes I scratch my head. Sometimes I want to say other things to them, but you know, I, I, I fix it. And a lot of times it's just a routine uh, breaks or buckets that have uh, broken shanks, uh, tooth shanks. Because uh, Austin's so full of rock, it's really hard on the equipment out here. So if a tooth breaks off, you got to weld it back on. Then actually, it, there's a what's called a shank, and that uh, tooth shank attaches to the bucket. And then you slip a tooth on it, and you pin the tooth on. So the tooth is a consumable, uh-huh. and uh, sometimes they will they will beat the rock. You know, instead of getting a jackhammer, so they would just beat with the with the open end of that bucket on the backhoe, and it'll just snap the end of it off. You know, a lot of arc gouging, a lot of stick welding. Uh, then of course the abuse that all the machine takes will, will develop stress cracks in different areas. Some machines have more issues than others, so. If uh, a customer says, oh, the boom is broken or the dipper stick is broken on a, on a backhoe or excavator, and I'll ask them, hey, is it on this section here? They say, yeah, okay, it's a familiar break because that's just something that always breaks on those machines, like a design uh, flaw or, or a weak spot. Yeah, hmm. but at least then it gives you a little bit of an idea of what you're walking up to. Yeah, somewhat. Uh, and, you know, and then, of course, you have some that would just tear the end of the pin or the end of the boom off completely. And then I'm just sitting there looking at it like, what? Why did you stop it, you know, you know, a week ago? You know, it's no big deal. It, it, it's only metal. I just glue it back together. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds, I mean, just my initial thoughts when you're, when you're talking about this, that you definitely have to be more than just a welder. You know, I mean, you got to be welder slash mechanic slash rigger to, to make some of this stuff happen. Yeah, and it's interesting because I, I, get, a, I get a lot of calls for, for folks too that want me to turn wrenches for them and unfortunately i've been shying away for that from that because there's just so much broken stuff in in the area so a lot of times uh, i speak with the mechanics and they'll say they can tear it apart for me and that helps out tremendously because that cuts down on a lot of labor hours on my end and mm-hmm. i can jump from machine to machine a little bit quicker for them what type of radius do you work in i mean is it just local stuff or do you go out pretty far i'll go out from uh, since i'm in austin I'll go out to about Waco, uh, Houston, and San Antonio, each for or about an hour and a half, two hours away. So uh, at least 150-mile radius, I guess. Wow, that's that's a pretty good coverage area. Yeah. Uh, you know, my customers uh, do work in this whole central Texas area, so they take on jobs. And, you know, the, there's rock all over the place, uh, more so to the west of Austin than east. So anytime I get a call and they tell me, oh, we're in west of San Antonio or the north side of San Antonio, I know there's problems because that's really hard <laughs> rock. For mm-hmm. How did you get into welding, Isaac? 
Well, surprisingly, I'm the first welder in my family of any side. My dad worked for a utility company, and uh, one evening he just decided he was going to work, build himself a little trailer. So there's a pile of steel and, you know, in, in the carport underneath. I was young. I was like about 10 years old or something. And, you know, all the, the sparks and the lights and, you know, all the flashing and stuff was uh, really impressive. And so, of course, he told us to go inside. And next morning, come out and there's a trailer built. Uh, and it's like, wow, that's the coolest thing. You, you built a trailer out of nothing. And so uh, from that point on, that kind of just sealed the deal for me. I wanted to be a welder since I was young. It's crazy. That's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Now, did you so, did you think you were going to be in the field that you're in? What what made you gravitate towards the heavy equipment repair? Well, initially, you know, I went to school for it even. Uh, as soon as I got out of high school, I went to school for it so I could learn welding. And then, of course, um, it took me a long time to, to graduate from that school because I couldn't afford it. So I had to go for the first uh, semester and I had to go to work for another uh, couple few months, save enough money, go back. So a one-year course took me like four years. So it took a, a really long time. But um, down where I'm from, the market for welders, is there, there isn't much. So I had to move to Austin. I was passing through a little TIG job presented itself and I went and I tested and they said, how soon can you move up here? And it was a no brainer. Uh, I, I was welding galvanized fencing, mm. um, you know, frames uh, down in the valley uh, for six twenty five an hour. And they paid me twelve fifty. So it was just came over here as fast as I could. So That's I hadn't looked back since then. You know, it was really neat. Worked out well. Oh, so back to your question, right, about what uh, led me to the heavy equipment. Yeah. I worked at various shops for about 10 years, just off and on, different shop here, uh, job shop there. Actually, my first job was uh, welding uh, here in Austin was experimental aircraft uh, frames, you know, 4130 tubing, really thin wall, old 35. So that brought me here. And then from there, I went to a, a chassis shop a race car chassis shop and we did a lot of back halves and roll cages and uh, narrow rear ends and things like that and so i finally worked my way to a job shop a machine shop and a welding shop and that's where i think i learned the most because they would accept uh, almost anything that fit in the door you know they would either fix it or build it and so that really helped me learn a lot of different processes you know that one day you'd be doing a lot of mig for a week and so you get pretty good at that same thing with TIG welding and, of course, stick welding. And what I noticed is that I ended up being the guy that they sent out in the field. And so I would see the need as to what was needed out in the field. And I noticed that a lot of other places didn't do heavy equipment repair because it's actually hard work. You know? Yeah, so, it is. Um, that interested me, and I noticed that there's very few people doing it, so that's what I'm going to do. So I slowly uh, started purchasing tools as I was still working uh, bought my welding machine. My dad helped me with that first. Got me the truck and started buying tools and setting them aside and slowly uh, working my way to getting out. And so once I left, I was pretty well stocked up with, uh, you know, the basic tools to say to get started. And so when I first went out, uh, I did almost anything. A good friend of mine told me, you know, get yourself some business cards and then then do the three foot rule. And the three foot rule is that, yeah, <laughs> give anybody within three feet a card, you know, give them your business card. And so I did. I just handed my business cards to everybody. And, you know, you never know where your cards are going to end up. So I get calls to do fences and handrails and stairs and, you know, miscellaneous little things and residential repair, repairs, mower decks, you know, silly little stuff. But it was, it was getting money in. It, it was a process because you, you kind of have to go through that so that you can. Um, get to what you want to be doing uh, in, the, in the long run. So that's um, I slowly work my way to where I don't do any more handrails and I don't do any more uh, fencing. Um, it, it's too competitive in that market, uh, at least here in Austin. And so I let them have it. I call people that, that uh, want to do it and I'll give them the jobs. And But the heavy equipment side, that's the actual uh, hard stuff. So I, I enjoy the challenge. Well, that's awesome. Makes yeah. sense to me. I mean, there's a. It makes perfect sense to me because number one, it's there's a lot of variables involved. A lot of people just can't handle that, and like you got to have portable equipment that automatically thins the herd again. And mm -hmm. then you know, like I said, the, the, the miscellaneous skills you have to have about being sort of a, a little bit of a troubleshooter, a little bit of a mechanic, a little bit of a rigger, a little bit of this, and and a lot of welder. 
And now you've thinned the herd a lot more as far as the people that can actually do it and do it well. And if you can, then, you know, there's a lot of money tied up. That guy, if that machine ain't working, it's kind of like an airplane that's on the ground uh, for Delta. It, if, sure. it ain't, if it ain't making revenue, you know, they, they're still paying the paying the payment on it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a, so they, they got to they gotta get it fixed. And whether it's 50 bucks an hour or 150 bucks an hour, it's really not that big a difference to them as long as you can get it fixed. You know, that's kind of my experience. And it's interesting you say that because when I first started out uh, coming from that shop, I learned how to art gouge. And that's a that's a skill that a lot of folks don't have anymore, or very few have. I was actually going to ask you about that. You you had mentioned it before, and that's something that I've never even really seen before. Yeah, I mean it's amazing. It's the only proper way to to penetrate any plate material. That's anything really, because you can art gouge, you know, something as thin as three sixteenths if you're careful enough, and uh, get to a hundred percent penetration. You you art gouge a little bit on the top, you put a weld, you art gouge from the backside. You know, it's a hundred percent again. Up to, you know, however thick you can go. Yeah, so, uh, for the people that are listening that might not know what art gouging is, can you give just a real quick rundown of kind of a description of what it is? Okay, so art gouging, it, uh, maybe maybe better for Jody to say it, but uh, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's if an If you want experience. me to, I will. I don't care. Yeah, sure, that'd be great. <laughs> well, art gouging you know, takes quite a bit of current. And you can use a stick welding machine, uh, various kinds, and that's not all you can use. You can use just pretty much any machine that will stick weld as long as it's got the duty cycle. And really, you kind of need some, for lack of a better word, some balls with the machine. And you got different size carbon electrodes that you can use all the way down to probably one-eighth and up to probably really big, like three-eighths. You hook it up to a to compressed air, and, and you chuck the carbon electrode up in a in sort of a stinger like a stick electrode but it's got a little orifice that shoot high a high velocity stream of compressed air so they shoot it right down the length of that carbon electrode and so once you get the arc started that stream of compressed air just just oxidizes the metal and just blows it out in a stream a 20 foot stream of sparks and you if you're good and you have things set right you can make a nice little groove nice little channel uh, either you're gouging out a crack or like Isaac said earlier, you're you're gouging out a groove like you would instead of grinding a groove and you weld it. And then when you go on the backside and you gouge out the backside all the way down to where you previously welded from the other side. And then you weld that and you got 100 percent penetration weld. So it's very useful, but it throws a lot of sparks. It's unpleasant. And, and a lot of people just hadn't had an opportunity to learn it. And, you know, if you put the if you put the electrode in or uh, upside down or have the stream of air wrong upside down or some things like that, you know, you, things can go south on you. But it's, it's really a fairly simple process. And you can fill in the gaps for me there, Isaac. Uh, I just that's just a simplistic explanation of it. So yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, once you create the arc, the air blows away the the molten metal, and uh, so it just creates a void where you've arc gouged. So these thicker materials, you know, plate one inch thick, there you will never grind, you know, enough to uh, put any good strength in that weld if you use a grinder. So you just arc gouge it and create a big old bevel as far as you can go, weld it up, and like you said, do the backside. And man, it's a fantastic tool. It's one of the first tools I bought when I left uh, when I went out on my own. It is a fantastic tool, but, you know, I have a few bad memories. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, uh, if you I can imagine, if you, yeah, in heavy equipment, you'd probably encounter the same things I encounter. But on, on powerhouses, you know, you might have, you'd have to arc out something that's up near, the, near a concrete ceiling. And so you're up in the corner of a concrete room and having to arc out something up there. And all that, all that fire has just got nowhere to go but back on you. You know, so yes. you really got to you really got to suit up for it in those in those uh, occasions like that. You eventually will get burnt everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so is every. It, <laughs> yeah. So is it a, uh, a completely separate machine then from a from no no a welder? you can. So it's uh it's an, an additional accessory. So it's an additional electrode holder that has that you clamp on your regular stinger onto it and uh. you hook it up to compressed air. Not oxygen or anything else, just compressed air, uh, you know, off a compressor. And so the amperage runs through it. Uh, I, I currently run a quarter-inch uh, carbons, and I'm able to gouge at 200 amps. You know, you just create the arc, start put the air on first, create the arc, and it'll start blowing it away. Now, if you mess up and go in the wrong direction, as, as Jody was mentioning, you can deposit a layer of carbon on there 
and then you will almost never get under it. You'll have to actually grind it out. Then you can start again because, you know, the carbon creates a bit of a shield and then you're in trouble. So mm, now you've got hardenable material there. Yeah. yeah so yeah. It's, it'll be a challenge after that. So, but so you ever done that? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it sounds yeah, easy. Uh, not, Speaking from experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've done that before. And sometimes, you know, I'm underneath these uh, dozers uh, because the, the track frames themselves would, will take some serious abuse, you know, so just uh, fatigue and wear or, or where the end of a gusset is well that it'll start tearing and you'll be underneath there and you don't hit it just right. You'll deposit a layer of uh, carbon. And like Jody was saying, you know, that sparks would just land all over you. So you get some fall on your neck, you know, on your belt line, on the sides of your knees, you know, it just, it'll get you. It's going to get you. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Just, it's, that's part of the gig. It seems like, uh, two questions come up, Isaac, um, and I'll go ahead and ask them first because uh, I'll forget to ask the second one once we get talking about the first one. What machine are you using to arc gouge? And then secondly, um, I would imagine that after years of repair, you've kind of almost got a good idea on design flaws on places that tend to crack. So yes. Okay, so initially I bought me a, a Miller Trailblazer um, 302, and uh, that has enough oomph to do it and i would have uh, a a standalone engine drive air compressor you know one of those a small one even uh, one that i bought from a uh, northern tool you know gas drive engine mm-hmm. drive and that did the job really good but now uh, after a lot of years i've moved up to the uh, miller uh, trailblazer air pack and that thing has plenty of air so it, it does a, a fantastic job for what it is uh, it's a pricey little unit but is definitely worth it for my type of work so i'm, I'm glad i purchased it and, so that's uh, welder and compressor kind of in one one all package. In one. Cool. Oh, wow. All in one package is really, really neat. I mean, it's uh they're proud of it, which is fine. But when you don't have to stop and maintain another separate engine or refuel another engine that runs out two thirds of the day, you just have this one unit, it is really efficient. Really, really efficient. And then you suddenly glad that you bought it. So that that was good. That's pretty cool. I forget the other question already. The uh, design thing, you see certain places that tend to crack all the time, and, and so you, you would kind of get an idea like, okay, I see I see if the, you know this gusset is terminating here and it's always cracking on the end here. I just, I just would think that you would get a really good idea on, well, they should have they should have maybe put a doubler there and then put the gusset on to spread the stresses out or, or things yeah. like that. Yeah, so uh, backhoes are a lot of my work. Because those are, you know, right on the edge of super industrial machines, you know, but kind of small for the rock that we're in. So those take a, a majority of the beating out here. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of the booms, uh, just from either using a jackhammer on them, so you know, they'll use a jackhammer and they'll they'll hammer that rock and wedge that tip in there, and then they start yanking side to side on the boom, you know, to try to wiggle that piece out. And I'm sitting back looking at it like, whoa, you no, know, take it easy. But you know, it's what you have to do to get it out. Yeah. So just uh, just inherently, they just have these problems that certain places give way. Some customers will tell me, you know, all stressed out. Oh, my back hose broke over here. And like, ah, no problem. I got you. You know, so <laughs> yeah. so in a sense, uh, I know what to expect at that that part of it. But then, like, uh, like I mentioned before, if on the very top, uh, the basically like the elbow of an excavator at the very highest point, sometimes those develop cracks and you don't even see them. And the operator won't notice them at all either because it's so high. And so suddenly the the cylinder's pushing. You know, you got great big cylinders. They're about six, eight inches round or bigger. And pushing this massive piston, it'll just rip the ears right off. And so then, then that becomes a, a headache. But, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you just cut it all apart uh, and glue it back together. Yeah. What would you say your biggest job stress is with dealing with that kind of stuff? Is just poor maintenance on the machines or, you know, is there other things that are just really stressful? Uh, stressful to me, you're saying, or yeah. to, well, I mean, nothing's really stressful. The only stressful part, I guess, would be that the time frame that I allow myself uh, in my head. I shouldn't, but because I don't know what I'm going to go uh, see when I get there. So I get a general idea sometimes and I show up and say, not bad. I can fix this one in this amount of time. I'm good to go. Uh, I'll be able to go to the next job. I used to do more than uh, two or three jobs a day. So I was just like, bouncing like a ping pong ball back and forth all over the place but i've learned to slow down just a hair because you just never know uh, what's going to come up or what you're going to see even if they try and describe the the issue to you 
uh, I lock myself either two or three max. And of course, the stress is only it's only as tough as I make it. So if I don't stress about it, it's not that tough. Mm-hmm. Sure, a good way to look at it. Yeah. I don't think welding is that much different than anything else. In in that everything takes longer than you think initially. Yeah. You know. Almost. Yeah. You know, and it just, you're going to run into uh, surprises, just like all those home improvement shows, you know, oh, they got to call the owner because, oh, all your cast iron piping is corroded and we got to replace your plumbing, you know, it's extra right. 2000. Well, you know, that's just, that just happens with everything, you know. Yeah, and what's interesting, I get a lot of uh, young folks on Instagram that, that say, hey, how did you get into it? Or what is your craziest repair? How do you handle such large, uh, you know, issues that come up? And and realistically, you just have to approach it as the way you would eat an elephant and you eat it one bite at a time. You know, so you don't overstress yourself from the challenge. So if you know you can do it and I, I've been welding, this is my 25th year at it now. So nothing really surprises me anymore. Uh, I shake my head at some of the things that they do to those machines. But, you know, I, I show up and, and it's all tore up and I, I say, OK, well, no big deal. You know, just one step at a time, like they say, climbing a ladder or climbing stairs, and, you know, eventually you'll get it done. It's just a process. You just cut out all the old bad. A lot of these mechanics are trying to get these machines to uh, keep running as long as they can until I get there. You know, I'll tell them, hey, I can't show up till this day or that day. And so they'll say, okay, we're going to try and patch it up and get it running. And, uh, you know, there's a gob of nasty weld on there, but, you know, the art gouger does such a fantastic job of just erasing that stuff, so it's almost like it wasn't even there. And then I can attack the actual parent metal and gouge into it and then it's fine so um, yeah you know one step at a time it's no big deal Um, you know once once you get more experienced uh, you tend to relax about about some of these uh, machine breakdowns so they're impressive to look at because man it's cool this big old one inch plate just tore right off you know that kind of thing but you can just stick it back together and you know it's you bring up a good point people love to pile on and make fun of somebody's crappy weld but you know, just somebody's just trying to make something happen. The guy ain't right. a welder. He's willing to take a shot at it. Maybe he weld a little bit in high school. The the boss man says, "Hey, can you weld a little bit? Well, get down there. We got to, you know, we got to see if we can keep this thing going until Isaac can get here." So they gob on a bunch of nasty stuff, and like you said, so what? So what? It did right. its job, and it, it kept it bandaided it till you got there, and it was ugly, but. You know, you know how to remove it and took you an extra 30 minutes or so, maybe, and, no big and deal. Uh, which you charged for anyway. So, you know, like I said, no big deal. <clears throat> no uh, big deal. You know, these, these mechanics will sometimes uh, criticize each other. You know, when, when I show up there and they'll say, oh, this other guy welded it up. Look at that piece of junk. And I, I really hesitate on criticizing anybody's efforts because they tried at the best of their ability with what they could do. So, yeah. like you mentioned, they got it running. It lasted them another couple of days. Fine. Uh, I got there. No problem. Fix it up. They're good to go again. So I really don't criticize anybody. Yeah. In a perfect world, they would have just, you know, parked it and waited till you got there. And then you would had just to crack the gouge out instead of some gobs of metal, a uh, weld metal, too. But it's yeah, it's no big it's deal. It's just uh, you know, since the art gouger, those that don't know what art gouging is will struggle and grind it off. So those are the guys that want to cuss out those other those well, the welders that yeah. got it on there. But uh, the, the art gouging is so easy, uh, so does it so fast that it's, it's nothing's nothing's an issue. Let's say tomorrow the EPA says uh, 7018 is uh, killing the ozone layer, and they're they're banning them all. What are you going to mm-hmm. do now? What, what, what's your what's your next go to? I'm going to say catch me, uh, <laughs> <laughs> catch me before before I stop. You're gonna uh, buy up actually, all uh, uh, off of eBay. You're gonna buy up all everybody's <laughs> stock. <laughs> That's right. Uh, no, actually, I, I, some of the uh, repairs I do with with um, FluxCore, and I use uh, uh, FabShield 21B. Cool. And that has enough elongation in it that it it holds fairly well. I used to use uh, a Lincoln ro- uh, wire NR211. Great yeah. wire, burns nice, but it's just a little too brittle. So yeah. the the FabShield 21B does have just a hair more. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's called elongation, and it yeah. holds a little bit better. So I've done some bend tests with that, and it's it seemed to you know if you, if you did it right, you could easily pass a bend test with it, just like you could a 7018. The 211, I've done some stuff on that, and it popped like a I don't know if it was I don't know what the deal was going on. Yeah, there. I was I, I used to do some work on some uh, trenchers. They look like long chainsaws. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they look like a long chainsaw blade. So we would rebuild some of these trencher booms. And a lot of those uh, pieces that the customer would exchange the 
metal with would be a uh, real high grade AR plate. And so sometimes you put a it, Texas is hot enough that you don't need to really preheat some things, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And so throw a big weld on there, and sometimes it would just crack because it was just a little too brittle of a wire. For the type of work that I do in the positions that I'm in, you really have to be pretty proficient at stick welding because you're going to be welding uh, horizontally, and that's going to turn to vertically, uh, you know, with a crack, and then it's going to turn into overhead and maybe even at a diagonal. You know, these cracks just run in all directions, and I find that 7018 is just a really good rod. Some people say, oh, you, sh- you need to use a big 532 rod or, you know, big material for big plate. Sometimes I, I, I use even just a 332 little rod. You know, it's all about the weld puddle control, you know, mm-hmm. especially if the gouge is very deep and is very narrow. You want to be able to precisely put that welding electrode material in as deep as you can without creating any inclusions, you know, any slag inclusions. So these Good guys point. that use these too big, a, too large a diameter rod, you know, they have trouble with it sticking, uh, their amperage isn't set right, or they burn through, uh, different issues like that. So I'm a big fan of just using the, the proper size electrode. I carry them all. I even got some 1 16th little bitty uh, 6010s or 6011s that I use for sheet metal stuff. You just have to be prepared for everything, and, and stick welding is the way to go for me. Yeah, I got a question for you. How mm-hmm. do you uh, trace your cracks? Do you die pin and follow your cracks, or are they just plainly obvious? Most of the time, they're plainly obvious, and <laughs> it's interesting. Either there's dirt behind them or there's oil behind them, so you will see them <laughs> as you, you'll be able to follow them because the oil seep out at you. And so um, a lot of people say you need, to, you need to drill the end of the hole and, you know, so that to stop the cracks. That's very good and proper, but a lot of the things I do are not proper because you just can't put a drill there or you can't, you know, access these things to, to do that. And so I'll just gouge as far as I can see. And if I notice that the crack is, is uh, finished, like let's say there's oil behind it and I know that it stopped, I'll go an inch to inch and a quarter, maybe even an inch and a half past that section, still gouging just as deep. And I will put that first weld pass in, you know, pretty warm. I don't want to burn through because uh, I've done that before and, and there, there'd be a back wall of dirt. And, you know, that that's a mess once you do that. So mm. I'll try to get like, if, if I can only access one side, that's what I'm saying, I'll gouge you know, that inch and a half past the end of the crack, uh, when I run it hot enough, it should kind of blend in the parent metal to where it, the crack just disappears. Almost like when you when you tack a pipe or any structural plate, you can blend in the tacks. But here, mm. I blend in the end of the, the crack. Mm. That's a good way to do it. Yeah, yeah, it works. I mean, a lot of the things that do, like I mentioned to you, aren't really proper because, you know, you need to do a proper root pass or proper this or that. But when you're on the field, things really change on you in a hurry. Uh, there are certain uh, things that will present itself that you're trying to gouge and you don't know how thick the material is. And then suddenly you went too far and you notice there's a, a full wall of dirt. Now what? So yep. you got to try and fill it up as best you can. Uh, there's going to be terribly full of pinholes. But just so long as you close the gap again, struggle for that first pass. I mean, if you keyhole that end of the, that, if you've gone too thick, I mean, too, cut too deeply, and you keyhole that whole thing, and there's dirt all behind it. Oh, what a mess! But yeah. <laughs> if you're able to, yeah, man, you got to see some of the things I see. But if you're able to at least apply some material to close that gap, then you can go back in there and either gouge the, all the ugly stuff off the top layer, and then go over and put a small little weld to start kind of fresh, and then you can start over and, and get some good success out of out of a bad situation. Some of my, my worst repairs have lasted you know, years, and I, I scratch my head like, wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's holding, and it's fine. Let it run. Right. Honestly, there's a lot to be learned from working on stuff and then getting to see it years later, you know, whether it's aircraft or heavy equipment or whatever. You know, I remember old timers used to see parts come in. I remember working on this part like 10 years ago. And, you know, and I remember doing this, this weld and, oh, look, some, some bozo put the wrong rod in here and it's, it's all pitted up now because, and that kind of thing. But, you you know, there's a lot to be gleaned from that, that you can't really learn from any book or any video or any manual. Right, exactly. And um, I wish that I could uh, show some of these things more so uh, somehow, you know, to these young ones, because a lot of these young kids, you know, do have a, a, a good strong desire. Oh, I want to go and fix equipment like you and do all these things. I, I get these comments on Instagram, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of followers that really want to do, 
type of stuff that I do. When you get out there, you realize it's a completely different world. So it'd be nice to be able to show them somehow or get longer videos to to show the actual work involved. It's not easy. Uh, people think it's really easy out there, and it's completely opposite. You don't know what to expect. True. What would you say is your favorite type of work, either a repair or just fab work in general? I would have to say repair because... I've done fab work for uh, several years at a that one job shop, and then I, I got out on my own, and I did some chill water piping for a couple few years. Those guys that weld pipe, my hat's off to them because they're good at it. You know, I got good at it too, but in my eyes, you're just welding in circles all day, so you better get good at it. You know, so <clears throat> that became uh, boring after a while because, you know, it can become um, too repetitive. You get real good. I mean, I'm not knocking these guys down at all because, man, those I've seen some of those pipe welds. They're fantastic welds. But I enjoy the challenge of fixing stuff, you know, just showing up. And it makes you think. You really have to think because you never know what you're going to see. And you have to approach or, you know, attack it once you get there and, and hope you do the best you can. Yeah. Do you have any repairs that, you know, when when the phone rings and they tell you what it is, you're just like, oh, no. And then yeah, other sometimes. One- <laughs> other um, ones where you're like, all right, that's going to be good. Yeah, well, uh, some things are naturally easier than others, but uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with foundation drill rig machines. Uh, they drill piers in the ground for buildings. Uh, they pour concrete uh, piers. And oh, so yeah. these yeah, these, um, these drill rig machines have what's called a Kelly bar that turns the auger. And some of these Kelly bars, the most inner Kelly bar, are either four or five inches thick, uh, solid. When they tell me they've snapped the Kelly bar, uh, I know it's going to be the whole day because you got to bevel that whole thing and get all the weld in there. It's not so much that it's hard, but it's very involved. It's a lot, a lot of work. So that's the only thing that that I'm not a big fan of. That and and welding big diameter casings for these drilling companies. I'll get uh, customers that call me and say, i got a 50-inch pipe I need you to come put together. And a lot of the times I'm by myself, so that makes it really tough. You, know, you really got to you know, use your brain to be able to muscle these pipes around and work them together to where they come out straight and, and cut them straight. You know? So yeah. that's, that's tough in yourself. And speaking of cutting, you being the uh, gas axe <laughs> wizard, mm-hmm. uh, you know some of the stuff that you, we see you doing on Instagram and all, I'm, I am sit there and just watch it over and over and over wondering, like, how the heck is he cutting like this one inch, inch and a half, even thicker plate with a torch? And it, it looks like it was done by a machine. Yeah, I, I kind of cheat because I use a, I have that little guide bar, but uh, um, I've I learned use that, that too. It doesn't work as nice for me, though. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of guide bar do you have, Isaac? It's just a piece of a two and a quarter inch square aluminum. It's 37 inches long. And I use a larger Victor Torch, a 315 FC. So the nut that tightens the tip, there's a small little shoulder. Man, it's about uh, eighth inch wide. I guide mm-hmm. it right along that uh, that piece of aluminum. And I just don't shake. Yeah. Don't shake. Well, if you do shake, shake in the direction you're going. That yeah, helps. exactly. You can shake back and forth, but not sideways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, one of the most important things I could recommend to these folks is just clean the tip, you know, and find a pressure that worked good for you. I haven't mentioned yet here to you guys is that I only use two tips. I use a, a triple lot tip on one of my torches and then I use a number one. And so the triple lot tip I'll use to cut all the way up to about five eighths plate. And that tip is only rated for three sixteenths or eighth inch. But I crank those pressures up and man, oh man, can it cut. Um, I run my pressures at seven and 70. So it's kind of a running joke, seven seventy, you know, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> of gas pressures but each torch is actually different because the one in my shop is like at 58 and 6 it just mm-hmm. depends on how that jet stream comes out of the center of that torch that makes the biggest difference in the world you got to really have a clean torch tip to have a, a, a great cut and that's the thing that that people uh, skip out on you know they don't they don't bother cleaning the tip sometimes i'll clean the tip multiple times on the same job doing you know multiple cuts something will get on there and deflect that air jet just a hair and that'll be enough to ruin your day and, and have slag, you know. Then you got to break up the grinder. <laughs> so, uh, yep. you know, and and find a pressure that worked good for you. Um, the, yep. I guess I like those. Uh, I like those pressures for my torch. I like that it cuts such a small kerf. That way, I can see it a little bit better against that scribe line. It does take a lot of practice, but once you get all those key things, uh, key ingredients, clean tip, good pressures, anybody can cut as good as I can. So it's, it's really not that special. So the tip charts. There are, are 
the thing if you don't have as much experience as you have, but then you take it a, a notch further and you tweak the pressures a little bit according to what the chip charts say and you get even better results. Yeah, so like I was telling you, I can I can cut like 14 gauge material with that triple lot tip um, and then I can cut 5 eighths right next to it in that same torch setting. The thing was when you start cutting plate anything thinner than eighth inch, sometimes the the slag or the, the molten slag coming out of the off the piece will re-glue itself to the back side of the, of the material you're cutting. That's and my so, problem. Yeah, so <laughs> in, in that case, if you have a, a guide of sorts uh, to run your torch along, put a very severe angle on your on your angle of your torch so you'll rest it up against the guide and maybe it'll be 30 degrees, 45 degrees. And once you start cutting, man, you can almost run with it and it'll blow all that slag away and you'll cut some real thin sheet metal with a torch. It's really impressive. Now, one thing I've noticed when in your videos and stuff is you push the torch i was always taught to drag it just so that you can see where you're cutting and stuff and i i've seen you pushing it and going the other direction and i'm like is that what i'm doing wrong no it's just me because i got tired of the spark getting in my boots so i had to learn something else so (laughs) it's it's just a, a, a habit i picked up back in the 90s when i was doing more torch cutting you know the sparks end up in your boots and you're jumping up and down you know like a chicken on a hot plate I've learned to push, I mean, push the torch on the bar instead. It's nothing any different than anybody else is doing. I just hmm. prefer it. Well, it seems to be working. Yeah, no more burnt uh, burnt ankles. So far as certifications, there's a lot of people that ask about certifications and everything. What certifications do you carry for your clients? Or what certifications do they um, want you to have to weld on their equipment? Uh, most of the time, these customers are just happy that I'm there to fix it. So... Um, they're just construction companies that don't really care. But on occasion, I'm, I'm working on uh, traveling bridge cranes, uh, gantry cranes. They're called my jacks. They got four tires on each corner, and they're, they got uh, hooks that come down on each end in the center. Uh, great tools, um, machines, but they do ask for certifications. And just the just the D1 one, I think, the structural, works fine for them. So I went to Texas State Technical College, but there's one in Harlingen. And so I just got the basic, you know, MIG, TIG, stick. Uh, all those processes, and then that's all I got from there. It's held up so far. Right. So what's the uh, best advice that you would offer anybody that's wanting to get into the welding field, or what's the best advice you have in general? Hmm. Best advice in general is just don't give up. Um, you're going to have some days that you know you may want it. For me, I really wanted to weld, so there was nothing that was going to deter me from welding. So I had to either get better quick or not give up. And so, you know, if you want to weld, weld anything you can. You know, so I see a lot of these kids that still practice, and practice is great. Practice, I even practice myself, you know, just to keep sharp. Everything, every job is practice for me. Um, it's always a learning experience, you know, like I mentioned before, that you, you may not be uh, doing the thing that you want to do when you first come out of welding school or when you first come out of high school. Or, uh, but if, if you're welding, you're welding. You know, you're you're getting some experience. Maybe you're just welding fences all day. No problem. Get good at it. You know, and then from there, you you you'll gain experience and you move on to your next step. And oh, hey, maybe I'm doing some structural stuff. Get good at that. And then if that's not what you want to do, you've gotten good at it. You can move on. So it, it's all a learning experience. You know, we learn every day. Just stick to it. What would you say the best advice is that has been given to you that has helped you along the way? Uh, well, you know, when I first was considering working for myself, uh, my dad was, you know, my dad's not a welder, so uh, he knew that I was getting better and better at it, and then I had the desire to go out and work for myself. Uh, he knew that I was slowly purchasing these tools a little bit at a time. A lot of these kids I've seen have gone out and got themselves these expensive welding rigs and got into debt up to their eyeballs, and then when the work runs out, they're in trouble, especially with the oil field stuff. So build up your tooling as best as you can while you got the jobs coming in you know don't get yourself in, in too much debt purchase things that you can afford them and then like i was telling you, my dad was when i made that jump my dad was telling me you already know how to swim so why not just dive off the high dive board you know so you know that was that was kind of uh, an eye opener that i already knew what i was doing and i had enough experience uh, i had 10 years under my belt at the time uh, out in the field and with different various shops and so I went and decided and hit it on my own, and it's worked out. Some kids, I think, jump too fast, and they get themselves in trouble. They can think about it logically, 
build up their tooling, uh, really consider their steps, just make wise decisions and, you know, make every move count. That way you, you don't have too many setbacks. Yeah, that's a, a really good way to look at it. One thing I'm kind of curious is on what, what got you on to Instagram? Uh, I don't actually remember, um, but uh, a friend of mine was, uh, actually, I don't even know how I got onto Instagram. But, uh, you know, like everybody else, they finally find that uh, they're on a, that there's welding pictures and then, you know, it, it drives you to do better like your, your other podcast mentioned. And, you know, I figured I can share something that hopefully helps some of these folks, uh, some of the kids, with, especially with the torch cutting. And so, uh, you know, I try and post as many videos as I can. And uh, I hope I don't get them too boring, you know. I, I'm not trying to bore people with my stuff, but I'm trying to help them see that, you know, certain things are possible, that you can cut this this way or do this that way. And so I try and be real descriptive as uh, best I can uh, to help them. But that's what's kind of motivated me to do it uh, to beyond or more so now, just to help these kids. Cause I didn't have that kind of teaching when I was coming to school. That old school teacher, mean guy. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I I know I sure like it when I see your your videos and stuff pop up. Yeah. All right, uh, let's give I, Isaac some uh, some advertising here. What uh, where can we find you, and what's the name of your company and your contact information? Well, um, my company name is Welding Repair Services, and I'm out of Austin, Texas, and I repair most heavy equipment. Anything that you can break, I can most likely fix it. That's about it. Isaac Arion, look me up. Instagram, I see weld. And uh, how can we get hold of you on that? Do you have a web page or phone number you want to put on? I do have a web page. It's welding repair services, actually. It's uh, also so um, it's an outdated web page, but most likely you can contact me directly through Instagram. I'm always posting pictures, and I think that's been part of why I've, I've gotten such a following. It's just been a domino effect. Or you know, got more and more and more. I just take a lot of pictures. Nothing really yeah. fancy. Well, I think it's a probably a pretty good place to stop and uh, say again, thanks a lot to Isaac for joining us on, on a really short notice this evening. And sure. um, it was really great talking to you and getting to know you a little bit better. I'm sure everybody that's listening learned a few things about a lot of stuff. I'm, I know I did. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, anytime you want to call or have me on again uh, for specific uh, uh, topics, if, if I can help, you know, because I'm only a stick welder. So uh, if, uh, that is not if, true. That is so <laughs> not true. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if I can help in any way, that'd be no problem. Cause I, I, I didn't get the help that I needed from the school that I went to at the time because of the old school teacher, you know? So I really want to help these kids learn by showing pictures and possibly talking to them and uh, giving a brief description on, on Instagram helps Well, then I'm all for it. You know, that way they can get better at it quicker. Right. All right. Well, thanks, Isaac, for being on. It was a pleasure. So that about wraps it up for this podcast. I'm Jody Collier. You can reach me at WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. I'm Roy Crumrine. You can reach me at CrummyWelding.com. And I'm Jonathan Lewis. You can find me at SuperiorWeldingFab.com. And if you'd also like, you can reach the podcast itself at WeldingTipsAndTricksPodcast at gmail.com. And if you don't feel like writing an email and you want to actually call in and leave a voicemail, our phone number is 915-308-7024. You ever use 7024, Isaac? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet. I'm a 7018 guy all the way. This is IC Weld, and that's a wrap. <laughs>